announcement for a change in the program. So Eric May, that was supposed to give uh, the talk uh, just before the last, will be here on Friday. He's not here today due to problem with his flights. So his talk uh, is uh, say moved uh, to Friday, the first on Friday morning. So uh, Mike's uh, talk will be the first one after and last after the coffee break. Okay, so without further ado, we have the talk by Mauricio Matteo. We talk about assembly pathway of, of a small uh, spherical virus capsid. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity, being here with you and in this very, very nice workshop. So I will start by telling you that I am a biochemist who has been interested since many, many years ago uh, in viruses. Uh, in particular, in trying to relate their structure their structure and with uh, their functions. And to do that, we have been using different biological, biochemical, and biophysical techniques. Uh, since about 20 years ago, my group has been interested mainly in studying assembly and disassembly biophysical properties, and this is mainly because I am here, and conformational stability and dynamics of ice particles. And we are currently using four different virus models to do this, depending on the specific question we would like to ask. We are more interested in, in, in basic knowledge, in, in trying to understand how viruses work, but we have also uh, some view on uh, uh, trying to use this knowledge to develop vaccines, antivirals, new biomaterials, and nanoparticles. So, uh, during this meeting, uh, Alex Balbuena, who is a, a senior postdoc in my group, is presenting a poster on uh, what we think is a very interesting uh, a, a experiment or a study uh, in uh, assembly, kinetics, dynamics, mechanicals, mechanical properties of the uh, protein lattice that makes the mature uh, capsid of the human immunodeficiency value. So if you are interested, please see Alex. Uh, poster, and he will gladly explain you this, this part of our work. But in this talk, I will focus on uh, our, some of our recent results using the minute virus of mice, or, sorry about that, or MVM for short. So, uh, the, in the first part of my talk, I will talk about assembly and disassembly in vitro. And this work has been done mainly by Maria, who is a, um, a PhD in my, in my group, uh, with uh, essential contributions by Alex Balbuena, again, and Miguel Angel Fuertes here. And in the second part of, part of my talk, I will talk about uh, some relationships between mechanical properties and biological function in this same virus, and this is related with the assembly process, and this work has been done mainly by Pablo Carrillo, who already defended his PhD in my group, again with the help of uh, Maria, Alex, and Alicia here has uh, helped in both uh, uh, types of, of study. I must say that uh, uh, Alex and Miguel Angel are physicists. Uh, Maria and Alicia and Pablo are biologists. And as I said, I am a biochemist. So in my group, we have very interesting discussions in those occasions when we uh, manage to understand each other, which is not always the case. So uh, I will start with the first part of the talk. Uh, we are, as I said, interested in, in studying the pathway of uh, self-assembly of a very, very simple spherical virus capsid. And this is because uh, uh, these uh, steps are two comparatively poorly known stages of the viral infectious cycle, and also because uh, it is very clear that they constitute a very interesting targets for developing new antiviral drugs. So uh, the one problem to do this is that understanding self-assembly of various capsids requires uh, a lot of knowledge on the assembly pathway 
through the identification of as many assembly, assembly intermediates as possible. And fortunately for a structural, structurally simple virus capsids, assembly intermediates and pathways have been predicted in much detail using theoretical approaches. For example, uh, uh, Dennis Rappaport here mentioned some early studies uh, from his uh, in which uh, 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 he uh, managed to predict a lot of details on the assembly of uh, icosahedral T1 capsid. I will uh, uh, refer to this uh, later on. So, for example, using, as he did, using uh, coarse grain molecular dynamic simulations. The problem is that uh, these predicted pathways for assembling simple viruses are frequently very difficult to confirm experimentally because of the very transient existence of most intermediate states. Uh, usually, when you look uh, experimentally to this process, you normally see assembly of simple virus capsids, very simple virus capsids, as a two-state process. So uh, in, this, in this study, we, we attempted to use a combination of AFM and electron microscopy, EM, to experimentally detect transient assembly disassembly intermediates for most simple uh, T1 icosahedral capsid, that of the minute virus of mice, the MVM. Uh, before I start with this, uh, telling you about this study, I must I explain some facts on MVM which are uh, important to, to help to interpret the results. So first, MVM is one of the smallest and structurally simplest virus, viruses known. It's 25 nanometers in diameter. The icosahedral T1 capsid is composed of 60 structurally identical protein subunits. There are no conformational switches. There are no quasi-equivalents. The capsid proteins uh, associate in the first stage into stable, stable trimers in the cytosol. And these trimers are transported into the cell nucleus, and 20 of these trimers in the nucleus constitute the stable building blocks, or CBDs, capsid building blocks, which each capsid is self-assembled in the cell nucleus. And I must stress this thing, this, this part here, there is no co-assembly of the capsid and viral nucleic acid. In this case, uh, in more or less exceptionally, the viral nucleic acid is single-stranded DNA, not RNA, single-stranded DNA. Only after the capsid is assembled in the cell nucleus, then the single-stranded DNA is packaged through one of the capsid pores at the uh, five-fold symmetry axis. So what we did, uh, what we, we did first is try to uh, disassemble and then reassemble the capsids. We purified capsids uh, formed in the cells. And we had to, first of all, to dissociate these capsids into as, as much as possible, into CBDs, into, into these trimeric subunits. And then we had to reassemble them. But not only that, we, we had to manage to uh, slow down the process in order to be able to uh, uh, visualize the intermediates. Because if you use, for example, a, a, lo a lot of uh, uh, denaturant and agent like, like guanidinium chloride, what you end up is with, you have either uh, capsid building blocks or complete capsid, but nothing in between because they are very transient. So to make a long story short, uh, finally, we, uh, we got uh, a, a very simple procedure in which we add a moderate amount of guanidinium chloride, and then we manage, if we incubate for a certain amount of time, we managed to uh, almost completely dissociate these capsids here. And then just by removing the, the dissociating agent uh, by dialysis or by gel filtration, depending on the experiment, we, we, we managed to uh, reassociate these capsids. And the efficiency under appropriate conditions of uh, pH and ionic strength, which are norm normal physiological conditions, pH around 7 and ionic strength about 0.15 uh, molar, uh, sodium chloride, you manage to uh, obtain uh, uh, reassembly efficiencies that can reach up to 80%. So most of the capsids are reassembled. And uh, the process, the, the, the reassembly process, followed a, a sigmoidal uh, kinetics uh, that was dependent on protein concentration, as expected for a nucleation and growth process. And by using different techniques, we uh, found that the reassembled capsids, 
For example, these are AFM images with high profiles, EM images, etc. Uh, these reassembled capsids are indistinguishable from the original ones. So then, uh, we look at the profiles uh, after this assembly, before reassembly, and we observed only uh, small peaks which, whose height, cor height corresponded to those of expected for trimeric CVBs. But to make sure that these were only trimeric CVBs, we did a gel filtration uh, analysis. Before uh, this assembly and after reassembly, we got a single peak with, si with the size corresponding to capsids, as expected. And after this assembly, we got a single peak with the size corresponding exactly to uh, trimers of the capsid subunits, these CBDs, these capsid building blocks. So we now could uh, explore the intermediates between these trimeric CBDs and the uh, complete capsids. And uh, we obtained many, many images during the disassembly and also during the reassembly processes at different times, and we uh, uh, analyzed these images. And, we, and it's important to, 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 to notice that uh, we both used EM, like in this case, and also AFM, because they are complementary techniques that allow a much thorough characterization of the types of intermediates we observe. So by uh, looking at the uh, EM images, we can see here that uh, you can uh, observe different uh, uh, incomplete capsids that goes here in this assembly for almost complete to uh, very small fragments. And when you look at the difference in, in, the, in the angles obtained by these arcs, uh, the difference between one and the other could be just one trimer. So it appears that you have here almost all possible intermediate, of course. Uh, it's just a simplification, but there are no discontinuities in the process, as far as we can tell. When we look at the reassembly process, most interesting one, of course, we observed exactly the same types of intermediates. I don't uh, have time to go into details, but we didn't see any difference by looking at disassembly or reassembly. And then we had to uh, put some numbers on this and We uh, took a lot of images and we uh, did uh, uh, countings of different types of particles. We grouped the particles into different classes. For example, uh, sorry again. This could be class one, class two, class three. And we counted the number of particles as a function of time and what we observed, as we expected, is that a smaller fragments during this assembly occurred later. For example, these fragments in red, is, this is the curve, and larger fragments in blue occurred earlier during this assembly. And the opposite was true when we uh, explored assembly. Uh, smaller fragments occurred first, in red a line here, and larger fragments occurred later, blue uh, line here. But uh, EM is not able to characterize in, in enough detail what types of intermediates you have during the process, so we resorted to uh, AFM. And just as one example, by looking at the topography and the height of different particles and uh, taking advantage of the uh, spikes, the protrusions that this virus has at the threefold symmetry axis, uh, you could see here that there, there is a trimer missing. I mean, you have, this is a complete particle. You have one, two, three, four, pro five protrusions uh, around an S5 uh, symmetry, uh, five-fold symmetry axis, and you have only four here. So one of the trimers is missing. And uh, by doing this with many, many particles, again, during different times, during reassembly and during disassembly, you can see this with uh, detail, but I can just explain you that during this assembly, we managed to observe complete capsids, capsids missing just one trimer, one CVB, capsids probably missing one pentamer of CVBs, 
capsids missing more than one pentamer of CVVs, isolated pentamers of CVVs looking at the height, topography, and even smaller fragments that by uh, doing different analysis, we know that are CVVs, just uh, free CVVs. And when you, we looked at the reassembly process, we observed, again, exactly the same types of intermediates. And this reversible process was very efficient. Oh, sorry, I forgot about that. It's just to, 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 to check that by uh, counting different types of particles using AFM instead of EM, we have the same results. So this is a disassembly experiment in which different types of particles observed by AFM are counted. And again, particles that are uh, more complete occur earlier than particles that are less complete, as expected during this assembly. Yes? Did you also observe the monomer concentration? It's, it's only trimers. Why? Because monomers are not stable, are not folded. The trimers, well, the monomers have very, very long loops that intertwined to form a trimer. If you just dissociate the trimer, the protein is unfolded. So how about trimers? Do you have trimers in solution? You, we have trimers in solution, yes. So did you, were you able to apply something like the law of mass action? Sorry, to? Could you apply the law of mass action to compare the trimer concentration that you can get to the assembled Yes. No, 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 we, did, we, did, we didn't that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I understand, yeah, could, could, of course, could be done, but we didn't that. Okay. So what I was telling you is that this uh, reassembly process is very efficient, is reversible, and occasionally, but only very occasionally, you have some uh, off-pathway intermediates, like these filaments here, but they are extremely rare. So, in conclusion, uh, MVM assembly may proceed as a nucleation and growth process in which trimers are sequentially added to the growing capsid, like this. Pentamers of trimers and capsids missing just one pentamer of trimers, or only one trimer, are conspicuous assembly intermediates. The reversible assembly disassembly process appears to follow the principle of microscopic reversibility, with the same, exactly the same types of intermediates being observed in either direction. And very importantly, this study provides experimental verification of many features and many, many details that were predicted a long time ago on the virtual self-assembly of an empty T1 icosahedral capsid from 20 triangular subunits, exactly like our actual trimers. And this was done, uh, as predicted by molecular DNA, this was done, was done, as I said before, by Dennis Rapaport, who is here with us. So going to the second part of my talk, I would like to, to tell you something about our analysis of uh, structural determinants and biological relevance of a mechanical property of virus capsids, as you have heard uh, Pedro and, and Bauter telling uh, uh, very interesting things about this using very different viruses. We were interested in trying to relate uh, precise structural determinants and the possible biological relevance of capsid stiffness, in particular, using MVM as a a model of a very simple virus. And in this uh, 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 talk, I will talk about uh, the role of amino acid residues, the, role, the mechanical role and the biological role of amino acid residues that are specifically located at interfaces between protein subunits, specifically between trimers. So uh, before that, I must say that we have been uh, uh, studying uh, during a lot of time, about 12 years ago, uh, relationship, relationships between virus atomic structure, mechanical stiffness, and biological function. And we started to do this because uh, uh, we, we started a collaboration with Pedro de Pablo's group. And we have been doing many experiments and many studies together. I'm not going to talk 
on these collaborative studies today, but we did a lot of them. And for us, it was also very important that Pedro and his group uh, uh, taught us how to determine, uh, uh, how to use an AFM and how to determine mechanical properties of viruses. So this, this, all the work we have been doing, trying to relate mechanical properties with other biology and structure and so far and so, and so on, uh, have been because of this uh, collaboration uh, that we started with Pedro many, many years ago. So what we specifically do to, to do this type of studies is, first of all, we inspect the uh, uh, atomic structure of the virus, in this case, NVM. We have been using other viruses as well. Uh, we revise previous structural or biological information and make some hypotheses on the possible effects of amino acid substitutions on stiffness and structure and or function, depending on the uh, specific study. Then, we genetically engineer capsids or virions carrying individual point mutations. So one per capsid subunit. In this particular case, we have mutated a, a, a amino acid here to alanine. This one, this is an asparagine. We have mutated it to alanine, so we have removed just one amide group in each capsid subunit. And then we uh, check mechanical properties, uh, function, structure, whatever uh, we are interested in in this particular case. So. Um, then, we use AFM imaging to determine the orientation of individual particles. As I said, this is very easy in this particular virus because we can clearly see these protrusions. This, is for, this particle, for example, is oriented with a five-fold uh, symmetry axis on top. Uh, we perform nano indentations with the AFM tip, just as Pedro and, and Bauter told us, and compare the elastic constant at different uh, regions of the capsid, uh, regions around uh, two-fold symmetry axis, S2, three-fold symmetry axis, S3, or five-fold symmetry axis, uh, S5. And then we analyze these changes uh, uh, in mechanics, and as I said, we related them to other uh, properties or structure or biological function or whatever. So by doing this so far, we have uh, determined the effects on mechanical stiffness of as much as as many as 34 biologically relevant point mutations. Each of one or each of these remove or replace individual chemical groups, as I uh, exemplified before, in the virus capsid. For example, looking at DNA binding sites or around capsid pores or at intersubunit interfaces. And I will refer here to this last study. Uh, what in this, in this study is still ongoing. We asked whether different amino acid side chains that establish non-covalent interactions between capsid subunits could have different roles on virus mechanics. So what we did is to choose individual side chains, in particular 12, at intertrimer interfaces, shown here in green. This is a trimer. This is a pentamer of trimer. You can see here the interfaces between the trimers and the selected residues to be mutated to alanine to remove these groups. And these groups are involved in different types of uh, non-covalent interactions, like hydrogen bonds, carbon-carbon hydrophobic contacts, van der Waals interactions, a combination of several of these interactions together, etc. Uh, as I said, we truncated them to alanine and purified the capsids, the mutant capsids, and compared their stiffness with the uh, uh, natural capsid stiffness. And these are the results. I won't go into any details. These are, are just histograms showing the elastic constants and comparing for different axes of symmetry, different mutants, in each case comparing the results with the wild type, the reference results. But I, what I would like to do is just to summarize the general uh, results of this study by saying uh, first that we found, contrary to what we hoped, we found no relationships between variations in stiffness and either type of chemical group removed, irrespective of it was a polar or polar, charged or uncharged, small or large, etc. We didn't find any correlation, any relationship between type, between stiffness and type of estimated strength of intersubunit interactions removed. We didn't find any relationship between distance between stiffened capsid regions and the mutated residue, but we did find a clear relationship between increased stiffness at S2 regions, at the interfaces here, 
and also S3 regions at the center of its trimer, far from the interfaces, and the location of the mutated residues in structural elements of the capsid. In particular, mutations in secondary structural elements at the core of each intertrimer interface buried uh, in the uh, 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 um, central part of each interface uh, invariably led to a a uh, high, uh, uh, higher stiffness and average stiffness increase was as, m as much as 50%. In contrast, mutations also at the interfaces, these, are, these first one are the red ones, and the mutations at exposed loops protruding from the main intertrimer interfaces, not at the cores, but at the interfaces that involved also in interactions, these ones had a very low effect on, uh, average stif on, on stiffness, and the average stiffness increase was only 8%. Moreover, um, most mutations stiffened S3 and S2 capsid regions, and virtually no mutation reduced capsid stiffness at any region. So these mutants are not natural mutants. These mutations are in conserved residues. In nature, these residues don't change. We force them to change. And the invariant result was that either the stiffness was the same or it increased even dramatically. In no case we found any mutation that was able to reduce capsid stiffness. And also every mutation that the stiffness S3 regions and all but one that the stiffened S2 regions in the capsid were invariably associated with reductions in virion infectivity. So we hypothesized, of course, this is a correlation, I know. In biology, many things are only correlations because it's very difficult to prove a cause-effect cause -effect relationship. So we hypothesized that the linkage exists between a stiffened S2 and S S3 and S2 capsid regions and reduced virus infectivity. And we challenged this hypothesis and we verified it by analyzing the effect on, the effect on capsid stiffness of an independent set of four unrelated mutations that we knew beforehand that reduced virus infectivity, but were not located at intertrimer interfaces, but at a different place, at intratrimer interfaces. So we predicted that if by stiffening these regions, we are in some way reducing infectivity, this uh, re infectivity reducing mutation should stiffen the capsid. And this is what happened in all of the cases. But then we had to explain how this stiffening effect could be related to a, a reduction in infectivity. And what we found, to make, again, a long story short, is that the mutations that stiffen S3 and S2 capsid regions invariably impaired capsid assembly. This suggests the mechanism by which stiffening these regions may impair virus infectivity. What we think is very simple. The trimer must be flexible enough to uh, be able to associate with each other with a high affinity. If you rigidify, if you uh, increase the stiffness of the trimer, and this you can look at the center of the trimer or at the periphery, then trimers won't fit so well and assembly is impaired. And because assembly is impaired, the viral titers are reduced. So, The last thing, uh, how much time do I have? Six minutes? OK, that's great. So w the next question we asked is, was, was what structural changes elicited by these stiffening mutations are responsible for this mechanical effect? So we started to address this question by analyzing the uh, structural effects of one mutation only, uh, this one I referred to before, uh, the uh, aspartame uh, to alanine mutation at position 170, here close to the capsid, to a capsid pore. Uh, we chose this mutation just as a representative example of all of the mutations we have been studying, and all of them were stiffening the capsid. So uh, we knew that this particular mutation stiffens the capsid both locally at the capsid pores, but also at regions distant from the mutation site. And as a part of a collaboration with us, uh, Nuria Verdaguer's group in Barcelona determined the crystal structure of this mutant capsid, and we compared it with the crystal structure of the wild-type capsid, which has been sold before. So the result was that the mutation causes quite subtle but significant structural differences 
not only locally here at the S5 at the poor regions, but also in many other structural elements located at distant capsid regions, including the S3 regions, regions around the threefold axis, and the S2 regions, regions around the twofold axis. Moreover, when we look at the differences in the structure between the mutant and the wild type capsid, if the movie works, you can see something uh, that we think is very interesting. Here is the uh, wild type structure. It's more expanded. And the other one is the mutant structure. It's more compacted. So it's very subtle. It's, it's a very small difference, but it's a clear and real difference between the two. There is a structural compactness, and we think that this compaction increases the interactions and increases the stiffness, not only at the pore sites, at the site of the mutation, but everywhere in the capsid. In addition, we looked at the B factors, at the temperature factors of the two structures, of the two crystal structures. We found that the wild type is very flexible, precisely at the five-fold axis, where the mutation is, and also in other loops. And when we compare the B factors, the average B factors, uh, uh, the, sorry, the normalized B factors uh, of the wild type with those of the mutant, we found that the mutant has lower B factors precisely in these flexible regions in the wild type. So I think this is another way to see, to look at the same thing. We are rigidifying the capsid, we are restricting, restricting the movements uh, because we are compacting the structure, we are in increasing the interactions, and this is something that affects, uh, depending on the mutation, different biological function. In the case of the mutations we have tested in, in the study I have mentioned before, is because this uh, loss of flexibility impairs assembly, and because of that, infectivity. So just to conclude this second and last part, many amino acid side chains, sorry again, Many amino acid side chains buried at intersubunit interfaces in the natural MVM capsid contribute to keep a low stiffness at S2 and S3 capsid regions. The limited stiffness of S3 and probably S2 regions may facilitate intersubunit association during capsid assembly, thus enhancing virus uh, yields. Two stiffening mutations, uh, the only ones we tested so far, led to significant structural differences and reduced B factors in many capsid elements, both close and far from the mutation site, and to a subtle com overall compaction of the capsid. I explained the results with one mutation only, but we did the same with the second mutations, and the results were very similar. And finally, very, very small chemical changes causing subtle structural differences can lead to large biological harmful variations in capsid stiffness. The last slide I would like to briefly comment on is a summary on uh, the relationship between a, a, a MVM stiffness and biological function, considering not only the uh, results I have presented here, but also previous results from our group, some of them uh, obtained in collaboration with Pedro de Pablo. And uh, what we can say is that uh, MVM, despite its remarkable structural simplicity, appears to have evolved a complex, a very complex mechanical behavior. First, an empty capsid with a biologically restricted stiffness at different regions. At intersubunit interfaces, as I explained here before, to, to facilitate capsid assembly. But also at a pore regions to facilitate the biologically required through pore translocation of functional components. This has been published before. And secondly, a virion, I mean a capsid with the DNA inside, in which segments of the uh, DNA genome are used as buttresses to locally stiffening specific regions relative to the anti-capsid. And doing that, uh, this stiffening is able to impair a heat-induced virus inactivating transition without impairing the flexibility of other regions, the pore regions, that are still required to uh, uh, allow through pore translocations that are needed for infectivity. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.